those who are visiting, we've been working our way through the book of Genesis in the last three months or so. So Genesis 5, starting at verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. I love, I love to study history. And I especially love studying church history. Because as a Christian, I recognize that in a very real sense, church history is my history. It's the history of the family of God throughout the ages. And I find particular enjoyment and blessing in reading Christian biographies, reading about the lives of the saints who have gone before and to see the, the ups and downs of their spiritual life, to see the faith and the hope that they displayed, to see the communion that they had with God, to see the ways in which they died in faith. They died in the hope of the resurrection. Well, this morning we come to a biblical genealogy, really the, the, the first somewhat lengthy biblical genealogy. Genealogies are often caricatured as being somewhat dry and boring, uh, and they don't really have any meaning to us. That's what a lot of people have the impression of when we come to genealogies. Well, I want us to recognize this morning as we come to Genesis 5, 
to recognize that this genealogy is, if we boil it down, it is the history of God's people. And it has glimpses of Christian biography within it. And if we have eyes to see it, there's great encouragement and there's great instruction to be found here. Now, as we come to chapter 5 of Genesis, for those who are visiting, I just want to set the context of where we have been in the last several weeks. In Genesis 3, verse 15, God had declared that he would put hostility between two lines, between two families, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And he had made clear that there would be a great conflict between these two lines throughout history. As we came to chapter 4, we recognized that this conflict was not so much between demonic forces and humanity as a whole, which is kind of the impression you might get initially. But what we saw in chapter 4 is we saw that there is a great division within humanity itself, between two great groups of people, what we might call the elect and the reprobate, between the godly line and the ungodly line, the city of God and the city of man, seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. In the first half of chapter 4, we read the well-known story of Cain and Abel, and we saw the, the hostility, the beginning of the hostility that would mark the interaction between these two lines. In the second half of chapter 4, in a sense, these two lines were separated. They were pulled apart, and we saw what characterized the development of each one. So we saw that the line of Cain, what we could call the ungodly line, is a line that is fully focused upon man. They're fully focused on, on this world, on trying to make a paradise out of this world with technology, with art, with music. But we saw that in contrast to that, the family of Seth were a people that were marked and characterized by their dependence upon God and their worship of God. Well, as we continue into chapter 5, the, the text continues to focus on the line of Seth, the family of Seth. And we're given really a more in-depth look at what characterizes and what marks the development of the godly line in history. Now, before we get into the text itself, I want to begin by drawing your attention to the first words of the chapter. The chapter begins by saying, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, this phrase, these are the generations of, is used 10 times in the book of Genesis. And it's really understood to be the key a dividing statement of the entire book. So if you look ahead to chapter 6, verse 9, you'll see it there again. These are the generations of Noah. And so with this statement dividing Genesis into its main sections, what that means is that what we have in chapter 5 in the beginning half of chapter 6, we have a short section that spans the long period of history between Adam and Noah. Of course, if you recognize the years of, uh, that these people lived, you recognize that we are being pushed along through history at a very, very, very fast rate. We're covering a period of over uh, 1,500 years with very little detail being given. It would be very easy for us to just breeze over this and, and move on to the, the story of Noah and the flood. However, it's here that the importance of history comes in. Because if we understand that history is the dealings of God with his people, we recognize that what we are seeing here is we are seeing God's preservation of his people, God's preservation of the godly line in a corrupt age of the world. And so what I want to do then is I want to look simply at three important things that mark the godly line in history. Three things that mark the godly line in history. We'll look at the purpose of the godly line then the groaning of the godly line, and then the hope of the godly line. So first in verses 1 to 3, we have the purpose of the godly line. The purpose of the godly line. Look at verse 1 to 3. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, he named him Seth. So these verses are given in a sense as an introduction to the genealogy that follows. And of course, they bring our minds right back to Genesis 1, back to the creation of man. There are a very clear allusion to the account of God making man in the image of God. There's this very interesting statement in verse 3. 
that Adam, or that we're told there that Adam fathered a son in his own likeness after his own image. Now, what is going on there between that contrast between man made in the image of God and Adam having a son in his own image? There's an older interpretation that would understand this verse in a very negative way. It sees this great contrast between Adam being made in the image of God and Seth being made in the image of Adam as a negative statement of the fact that Adam's sin is being passed down to his children. So Adam was made in the perfect image of God in righteousness and holiness, but his son was made in his corrupt image, his image that was tainted by sin. So just as pigs have baby pigs and dogs have baby dogs, so sinners have baby sinners. That's the impression that this older view of this verse would say. And it's especially emphasizing that the fact that Adam had faith doesn't change the fact that his sin is being passed down throughout the generations. And there's truth to that interpretation. However, I think it's more likely that these verses are highlighting the idea of, of imitation. We have a clear statement. It's not so much a contrast, but actually a parallel statement. That just as God created man in his image, so now Adam is procreating in his own image. He's imitating the work of God in his children, in a sense. And of course, imitation of God is right at the heart of being a faithful image bearer of God. So if we take it this way, we see that this is actually a positive statement. And it's testifying really to the fact that God's, God's purpose for mankind is being carried out in the family of Seth. So we know that God's image in man was distorted. It was marred by the entrance of sin. But here we have a testimony that the image of God is continuing in the line of the faithful. So we could say that the line of Cain, the ungodly line, the unbelieving line, as they drift farther and farther away from God, the image of God is becoming more and more obscured within them. And in a sense, that's what the scripture tells us. That as we drift farther and farther from God, we cease to be what we were meant to be as image bearers of God. And 2 Peter 2 would say that we become more and more like beasts, more and more like animals that just live for the passing pleasures of life, that live to fulfill our fleshly desires. And in a sense, that's the testimony of the line of Cain. However, in the line of Seth, by their dependence upon God, by their worship of God, in a sense, they are coming to know something of the blessing of God, and they are realizing the purpose of God for mankind. And of course, of course, ultimately, this carries us right to Christ. It's through the godly line that the, the perfect image bearer is going to come. It's through the godly line that Christ is going to come who will renew his image in his people. Well, Luke would seem to hint at this interpretation in his gospel. Uh, the, the gospel writer Luke, he traces the genealogy of Christ back to Adam. And he ends it by saying, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Tracing things right back to God, the preservation of the image that finds its fulfillment in Christ. Well, at the end of the day, I wrestled and wrestled with those two interpretations about which, which one is the focus of that statement. And I think there's a measure of truth in either of them. Both of them seem to fit the context. But I think at the end of the day, what we need to recognize is that what is being said here is that God is preserving his image. And brothers and sisters, as we think about the, the purpose of the godly line in history, this is something that is true of God's people in every age. We look around at a world where people are rebelling against God, and in a sense, we see that corruption is spreading. We see that God's original design for mankind is being thwarted, in a sense. People are dragging the image of God through the mud. And we look around and we say, where is the image of God, the clarity of righteousness and holiness and knowledge? More and more, it seems as though people are giving themselves up to fleshly passions. We're becoming like the beasts that perish. But here we have the purpose of the godly line in history. Testimony that God is preserving for himself a people. And in every age of the world, God will have his people 
who in some measure are what God intended man to be. The image of God is being preserved by God's grace in his church and in his people. And so we have the purpose of the godly line in contrast to what we saw in the line of Cain. Let's move on secondly then to see the groaning of the godly line. The groaning of the godly line. And this traces itself all throughout the genealogy. As we read through the genealogy of the chapter, the thing that really stands out to you is the extraordinary length of time that these, these men lived. It just stands out to you. 900 years, 700 years, 800 years. And of course, modern scholars and scientists will scoff at these numbers. And the truth is we don't know all the, all the details of how exactly this worked. And the impression that we have, the fact that Scripture is showing us, is that before the flood, for some reason, men lived far longer than they did after. In a sense, the curse of death, you could say, took time to sink into man more and more. Whatever else this testimony of long lives does, is it, it gives us the impression that the godly line is continuing under the blessing of God. See, in the Old Testament, and especially in the, the books of Moses, a long life is a testimony of God's blessing. It's interesting to note that in the line of Cain in chapter 4, there's no, there's no mention of how long they lived. But here there's a focus on them, their long lives to testify of the blessing of God. And they're having sons and daughters. They're multiplying and filling the earth like God called them to do. So the impression that we have is that here is a line, again, under the blessing of God in some measure, fulfilling the purpose of God in history. And so in, in that sense, we're given a quite, a quite a positive picture in this genealogy of the family of Seth. However, it's in the midst of that positive picture that there enters in this very sobering refrain that really rings through the passage again and again. And he lived, and he had sons and daughters, and he died. And he lived, and he had sons and daughters, and he died. And he lived, and he had sons and daughters, and he died. And he died, and he died, and he died. As we read through Genesis 5, it's, it's almost as though we're walking through a graveyard. We're reading the tombstones. And we see that in spite of the very long lives that these people lived, in spite of the children that they had to, to preserve their family line, we still, have see, still, at the end of the day, death caught up with them. So at the bottom of every tombstone, we read the words, and he died. See, God had said to Adam after the fall, you are dust, and to dust you will return. The Apostle Paul said, by one man's trespass, death reigned through the one. Death is reigning, even in the godly line, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Yes, God had promised a Redeemer, but in spite of that, the curse and the effects of the curse are still weighing upon the godly line. And he died, and he died, and he died. Even the godly line is groaning under the weight of the sentence of death. As we look at this mixed picture, we look at this, this mixture of God's blessing and favor, and yet we mix it together with the reality of, of the sting of death. We are being given a picture of what has marked the people of God from age to age and from generation to generation. We talked about Christian history. Isn't that fascinating about Christian history? As we look at Christian history, in a sense, with, with the eyes of faith, we see that, that the church is at the center of God's purposes in history. The church is the apple of God's eye. It's where God's special favor rests. It's where his purpose is being worked out. Yet in spite of those very positive things, as we read church history and as we read this genealogy, we have to come eventually to realize Again, stepping back from looking at it with the eyes of faith, but simply looking at it through the eyes of the flesh. It would seem as though generation after generation, the enemy of death has the last word. Generation after generation, the grave opens its mouth and it swallows even the godly. In spite of all that we have, in spite of the blessing, we lie under the burden of our death sentence. We know, you know, 
Every one of you knows what it is to shed tears of grief at the reality of death. As New Covenant Christians, certainly we have a fuller picture of God's purpose. But in a sense, this is still the case with us. We've been given a very full salvation, but we recognize that in a sense, much of that salvation we know only by promise. We have realized much more than these ancient believers did, but there is still a part of our salvation that we only have by promise. Its realization lies ultimately in the future. So the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that it is not until the day of Christ's return. It is not until the day that the saints receive their glorified bodies that we will truly and fully be able to say, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting and where is your victory? Because as long as we live on this earth, death still has a sting. And in a sense, it still gets the victory over our bodies. And so in various places, the New Testament talks about something in the people of God on this earth that is groaning. We groan, Paul says, for the redemption of our bodies. We groan for the day when we will be clothed with immortality. There's a groaning that marks the people of God throughout history. As the effects of God's curse weigh upon us and weigh us down. That's the picture that we have here. Scripture is making very, very clear to us that though we have God's promise and blessing, still the godly line has to endure the effects of the curse. And so there is a groaning within the godly line. Now I want to turn to our third point, and I want to spend most of our time here and that is the hope of the godly line. The hope of the godly line. So in the midst of this account with its somewhat depressing refrain of death, it gives us the impression that death is getting the last word. There are two points of light that shine in the darkness. Two glimpses of hope being passed down, marking the line of Seth. And these two lights are found first in the testimony of Enoch, or the life of Enoch, and in the words of Lamech. So we'll look at them then one at a time. So look at verses 21 to 24. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So we read through this genealogy, and we hear again of death coming, and he died, and he died, and he died. But then all of a sudden, there's a sudden break in the narrative. The refrain dies away. One commentator described it like this. As I said, it's as though in Genesis 5, we're walking through a cemetery. We're looking at the tombstones and their inscriptions. And, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we realize that a gravestone is missing. There's a gap in the family line. We know from the register that the, the register marks the date of Enoch's birth. But we can't find his grave. That's the impression that we have as we come to these verses. And there's two very, very unique things about Enoch that stand out in this genealogy. And the first is the description of his life. The description of his life. So just as with the rest of the figures, we don't have a whole lot of detail about Enoch's life. But the one description that we are given, and it's mentioned twice, is that Enoch walked with God. Now the phrase is not used very often in scripture. It's used here and then later of Noah and then later in Malachi it speaks of the relationship that faithful priests had with God. The idea of walking before God is far more common. It would speak of walking in obedience to God. But the idea of walking with God really emphasizes a personal and in, uh, intimate picture. It gives a picture of Enoch walking side by side, talking with God as he walks by the way. It highlights the fellowship and the communion that Enoch had with the personal God. And isn't that, isn't that beautiful to think about that? That we can take Enoch's life and the total summation of Enoch's life 
is found in that one little phrase. Uh, certainly, 365 years, there was more to Enoch's life. We learn actually in the book of Jude that Enoch, in some sense, was a prophet. He, maybe even a preacher of righteousness like Noah. He prophesied against the ungodly. But as his life is recorded here, the one thing that is noted is that he walked with God. It's actually interesting. If you look at verse 22, walk with God is substituted for lived. So in the rest of the verses, we read Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared, and Jared lived after he fathered Enoch, but Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. In a sense, what that's saying is that for Enoch to live was to walk with God. His life was walking with God. He could say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is to walk with God. He was a Psalm 73 man in the midst of a world that is where the corrupt are prospering. He could say, my portion, my portion is God. For me, it is good to draw near to God. It's actually very really interesting. Enoch's life is set in vivid contrast to the life of Cain's descendant Lamech in chapter 4. See, Lamech and, and Enoch are both the seventh generation from Adam, and yet their lives could not be more different. We saw last week that what marked Enoch, or sorry, what marked Lamech was arrogance, was violence. But what marked Enoch was walking with God. In a sense, we could say that in the line of Cain, the seventh generation ungodliness comes to its climax. But in the line of Seth, in the seventh generation, godliness comes to its climax. The second unique thing about Enoch is the description of how his life ended. How his life ended. We read in verse 24 that he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That is to say, Enoch did not die. In a way similar to Elijah, God took him up in a in chariot of fire. God supernaturally laid hold of him and brought him directly to heaven. And he never had to experience the rending apart of soul and body. Hebrews 11 tells us that he did not taste death. Can you imagine that? Imagine being his family. Imagine that you had a very godly grandfather. And every day he would go on this long prayer walk and he would meditate and he would pray. One day he goes out and he, he doesn't come back. And at first, you think he's just extending his time with the Lord. He's been known to do that from time to time. He's having a good time with the Lord, and so he's, he's taking time to get back. But as time goes on and he's not coming back, you begin to get worried, and you go out looking for him. And you know the path that he always walks, and so you, you go up and down. You look for his body. What happened? Where is he? And you can't find him. That's the impression that we have. We don't know what the, the impression of, of Enoch's family was. But Enoch was nowhere to be found. He was taken up into heaven. When Elijah was taken up into heaven, 50 sons of the prophets spent three days looking for him. And they couldn't find him. And Elisha somewhat rebukes them for looking. Well, so it must have been for Enoch's family. And when somehow it was revealed to them what had happened, it would have been this mixture of sorrow and yet mixed together with joy and wonder. Well, however confusing it must have been for Enoch's family, this record was given ultimately to be a comfort, a comfort to the ancient believers throughout history. Because it was a testimony that death can be overcome. It was a bright shining star in the midst of the darkness of death. And you can remember where we are. This is just mere generations after Adam. In fact, Adam would have been alive when Enoch was born. In a sense, they're still living in the sight of Eden. They can see paradise as a word. And yet here, death has locked them out of that. They weigh, they're weighed down under the sentence of death. And yet here, here they are given a visible representation of the resurrection of the godly from the dead. There's a testimony that the power of death could be escaped, could be 
email is an encouragement to us because it testifies to the reward, the hope that is set before us. It testifies to us that those who will walk with God now, no matter what kind of persecution, no matter what kind of pain it brings, those who walk with God now will be with God forever. Jesus said to the church in Revelation, He who endures to the end, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. And so this is a call for endurance. Brothers and sisters, walk with God. With all the temptations, all the corruption around you, walk with God. Walk in communion with God. Don't allow yourself to be distracted and pulled away from God. There is a hope that is set before you. There is a reward that awaits you in heaven. Walk with God through Jesus Christ. Let us now turn and look at the testimony also of Lamech. This is the second point of light, the testimony of Lamech. Look at verse 29. The Lamech fathered a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring relief from our work. And from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech's words reveal that on the one hand, he was feeling the burden of living in a fallen world. In a sense, he speaks as one who is weary, one who is worn out. The, the painful toil of our hands, the ground that God has cursed. In a sense, we see very clearly that Lamech is groaning for deliverance. However, as he groans... We see that he's not overcome by that weariness. But as he names Noah, he expresses his hope in the promise of God. Lamech's words are a testimony to the fact that the godly line was preserving the promise. The promise of Genesis 3.15. It was being passed down from generation to generation. The godly line had their hearts, had their hopes set on the one who would come, the offspring of the woman who would come and crush the head of the serpent. Now, some have conjectured that maybe Lamech thought that Noah was the Messiah, and that's possible. Maybe he got confused by whatever kind of prophetic insight he had. But whatever the case may be, what we do see is that Lamech had his hope set upon the promise of God and the coming deliverer. And he, by the Holy Spirit, recognized in some sense that Noah was going to bring some measure of relief. He's going to carry on the covenant purposes of God through through salvation and through judgment. And there would be a measure of relief for the people of God, a measure of relief for the groaning world. But at the end of the day, really what, what it highlights for us is that Lamech's hope was resting on God's promise of deliverance. Though I groan under the toil of the curse, God is going to send relief according to his promise. So once again, we have in Lamech another testimony of the hope of the godly line. We have the testimony of Enoch, that God would overcome the power of death. But we also have the testimony that that hope was set upon the promised Savior that would come. Brothers and sisters, again, this is a lesson for us. As we again groan under the effects of the curse with painful toil, with suffering, with death. As it goes on from generation to generation, age to age, and sometimes we find ourselves overcome by weariness. We are reminded here that hope of deliverance is to be found. Hope of relief is to be found in the promise of God. Just think about that. The, the ancient believers here, Lamech, he only had one promise to hold on to. One single promise. 1,500 years of death with corruption all around, and he had one promise to hold on to, and he held on to it, waiting for God. Brothers and sisters, we have promise after promise after promise. In a very real sense, we've seen again and again God fulfill his promise, most especially in sending the Lord Jesus Christ. How many promises do we have to hold on to in the midst of the groaning of this world? We have the promises of hope, the promise of of a resurrection. And I would say to you, as the writer of Hebrews says to his listeners, my desire for each one of you is that you will show the same earnestness, 
to have the full assurance of hope until the end. That you would not be sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Brothers and sisters, as you've grown, hold on to the promise of God. No matter how long it takes, God will not fail. Hold on to the promise of God. In the midst of this chapter, then, with its sounding refrain of death, we have these two points of light. As we read the long lives of these these men who lived, incredibly long lives, we're still faced with that last refrain, and he died. We're still faced with the reality that, in a sense, their lives were cut short. Death is not the way that it's supposed to be. And so even though they lived 900 years, they shouldn't have died. There's something wrong with that picture. They died an untimely death, in a sense. But in the midst of this, it's interesting to note the number of years that was lived by these two men. Enoch lived 365 years. He completed living a year of years, as it were, a well-rounded whole. Lamech lived 777 years, the number of perfection and the number of completeness. And I don't want to go too deep into that, but what these numbers do is they simply give us the impression that the lives of these men were not cut short. They lived a full life because they fulfilled the purpose of God for them. And Enoch walked with God and was taken. And Lamech died in the hope of the resurrection. Brothers and sisters, as we live our lives groaning under the effects of the curse and knowing that we too will one day face the sting of death, May we learn from Lamech and from Enoch that if we walk with God by faith and if we set our hope upon God's promise, we will not die until the right time. And we too then at the end of the day will die in the hope of the resurrection. And on the final day, we will join the saints throughout the ages, declaring with our Lord Jesus Christ on the day when death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Press on, brothers and sisters. Through faith and patience, may you inherit the promise. Amen. Let us come before our God in prayer. Our glorious God in heaven, we we marvel, O God, at your work throughout history. We marvel at your care and your grace towards your people. We marvel, O God, that you, in the Lord Jesus Christ, he who is the resurrection and the life, that you have overcome the grave. Father, as we live in this groaning world and as we groan within ourselves for the redemption of the bodies, we pray that you would help us to set our hope upon our Savior, upon the promise of his return upon the promise of the day when death will be swallowed up in victory. Gracious God, strengthen our hearts that we might walk with you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.